March 1921. Winston Churchill waves at the roaring crowd, taking joy in the gathering. He's received quite a welcome in Jerusalem. Days ago, he'd been at the Cairo conference, making decisions about the region's future. And he'd just met with Abdullah ibn Hussein to provincially offer him the throne of Transjordan, an offer that Abdullah had accepted. Already, plans are being made for his brother Faisal ibn Hussein's stage-managed entry into Iraq. A carefully overseen vote on him taking the throne would pass overwhelmingly. A large amount of money is also heading to Abdul Aziz ibn Saud to mollify him over the preferential treatment of Hussein's family. Churchill believes he saved the region, secured a homeland for the Jewish people, balanced the competing powers and interests of the Middle East, and missed nothing. Then, someone explains, this crowd isn't shouting praise. They're chanting anti-Jewish slogans, and they are not here because they like him. Pretty much the only people happy about the decisions of the Cairo conference were Faisal, Abdullah, and the British. But the British stopped being happy about it pretty fast. See, originally, Abdullah was supposed to be a temporary governor of Transjordan for around six months on a trial basis. But this man, never a great soldier, had proved himself an excellent diplomat and administrator. He gained support amongst Transjordan's various tribal leaders, convincing them that a central government was in everyone's interest. By March 1921, Churchill had clearly seen which way the winds were blowing and agreed that Transjordan, while still part of British Mandatory Palestine, could be an emirate with Abdullah at its head. But Churchill had miscalculated when he thought a simple increase in payments would mollify Ibn Saud. Hussein's family were, after all, some of his greatest rivals. And by installing the brothers in Transjordan and Iraq, Churchill had surrounded his kingdom with territory run by either Ibn Saud's local enemies or by Britain. So he did what made sense. He used Bedouin tribesmen to attack Abdullah in Transjordan. And as a result, Britain brought in air power and armored cars to defend its ally against its other ally and therefore getting embroiled in another unpopular Middle Eastern conflict. Exactly what they'd hoped to avoid. It would not be the last time that Britain would have to flex its military muscle to defend Abdullah. But here, there was a bit of a twist. Because while Abdullah was not a great military man, he was an able administrator. And while the Emirate of Transjordan did have British advisors in the government and military, its bureaucracy would be largely Arab, and therefore more stable after full independence in 1946, followed by its name change to Jordan. Then in 1951, Abdullah was walking into a mosque in Jerusalem when a Palestinian assassin, believing Abdullah was about to make a peace deal with Israel, shot him three times. His son succeeded him, and his family still rules Jordan today. Though in Palestine, things were also not going as planned. Now we realize we haven't talked a lot about Palestine in this series, partially because to give all of the proper context to Zionism, Palestinian nationalism, and the tangle of overlapping historical, legal, religious, and cultural claims, it would take roughly, uh, I don't know, let's carry the four, uh, a bunch of episodes. But in 1920, the board was set for what was to come. Neither Zionists nor Palestinians were very happy about the decisions made at Cairo. Both considered Transjordan a part of their land historically and culturally, not to mention its access to fresh water, having more rivers. Palestinians were more upset, though, by Churchill's reinstated commitment to the Balfour Declaration that Britain supported a Jewish homeland. His plan to implement the declaration was this. He would set up an experimental settlement area where Zionists could buy sparsely populated, underdeveloped land and use irrigation and agricultural science to make the region agriculturally viable. This way, he thought, not only would Jewish immigration not displace anyone, it would also benefit the whole of Palestine by bringing in money and boosting the economy. The problem was, well, I mean, there were a lot of problems, too many to really go into, but the biggest problem was that Churchill understood Arab and Palestinian opposition to settlements as primarily economic, worrying settlers would take land and jobs rather than what it truly was, religious and cultural. So he kept trying to solve it like an economic problem. And he also didn't realize that many Zionists, even if they said otherwise, ultimately did want to found a majority Jewish state. Also, while the upper ranks of the British government favored Balfour, the mandate civil service, police, and army favored the Palestinians and undermined progress. For example, they helped hardline Palestinian nationalists to positions of leadership, deepening the inability to reach any compromise. British military and police also stood by during the deadly anti-Jewish riots that swept Palestine in the early 1920s, refusing to punish those who had killed Jewish settlers. Hardline Zionists concluded that they could not trust the British to protect them and began to import weapons and organize secret militias. 
But this was nothing compared to Iraq, where there was an all-out war. In 1920, with control passing to the Royal Air Force, the tactics moved to indiscriminate aerial bombings, night bombings, and other terror tactics. When a Kurdish tribe in the north rebelled, the RAF struck its home village with bombs and machine guns, leveling nearly all of the buildings and killing roughly a third of its people. The campaign would drop 97 tons of bombs and kill 9,000 Iraqis. In exchange, only 9 British soldiers and 11 aircraft were lost. Parliament considered it a great success. And these bombings, in support of Faisal, would continue through the 1920s. Faisal would go on to, if not unite Iraq, at least gain mainstream acceptance as a monarch, partially because he immediately began pushing the British for greater independence. His administration tried to bridge the fractious nature of the country he'd inherited, including different ethnic and religious groups in government, both figuratively and literally. He built up the country's education and medical bureaucracy, while at the same time building roads to link the country. In 1926, Faisal and the British participated in a series of diplomatic negotiations to resolve the Mosul question. The fact that Turkey claimed the oil-rich Iraqi province was legally theirs and had been illegally annexed by the British mandate. After which, Turkey got a 10% cut of the province's oil for 25 years, and the northern province was recognized as Iraq. And Faisal did, step by step, win Iraq more autonomy and eventual independence in 1932. But there were still some major cracks. The year after independence, and just before Faisal's death, there were massacres of Assyrian Christians in the north, and the king's commitment to Arab nationalism alienated the Kurdish minority. And then there was the army. See, unlike the government, which kept many British advisors even after independence, the Iraqi army was almost entirely native, many of the officer corps having served the Ottomans. This contrast of a strong military and a weak civilian government became an ongoing problem in Iraq, eventually leading to the military coup that overthrew the monarchy in 1958. Meanwhile, to the north, in Syria, the French had been quite busy since they'd driven Faisal out of Damascus in 1920. But their campaign of modernization and administrative reform had alienated the population. French advisors frequently ended up simply doing the jobs they were supposed to oversee, frustrating elites who'd run the country through centuries of Ottoman rule. Not to mention rural tribes and villages hated the disarmament policies. But it was the meddling in the politics of the Arab Druze minority that eventually triggered the Great Syrian Revolt in 1925. For two years, Syria and Lebanon rose up. Yet while the rebels won initial victories, an intervention force of better trained and equipped French troops put down the uprising, killing 6,000 and leaving a further 100,000 homeless. It also ended French plans of direct rule, which it deemed too costly in the light of military intervention. Like in the British mandates, the French mandatory Syria and Lebanon too would see a gradually lightened imperial presence on the way to full independence in 1946. And then there was also the expanding nation at the heart of the Arabian Peninsula, the kingdom of Abdul Aziz ibn Saud. Having expanded his borders north and south since the end of the First World War, ibn Saud finally turned west toward his great prize, the kingdom of Hejaz and his rival Hussein ibn Ali. The initial attack was so devastating, Hussein abdicated, leaving his son Ali on the throne. The change in leadership did no good. In 1925, Ibn Saud captured Mecca and Medina, and now the king of two states. He would merge them in 1932 to form the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And there it is. Not quite today's Middle East, but the general boundaries are set for the world we think of today. You know, from A to B in 29,000 simple steps. But it wasn't just with lines drawn on a map. After all, our modern maps look different than Sykes-Picot or even the maps of San Remo. And that's because ultimately, leaders can make all of the plans they want, but at the end of the day, it's the people on the ground that make things happen. Until next time, everyone. Thanks so much to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, Mule Chikauri, and O'Reels One for being legendary patrons. <laughs>